uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, we will have a seminar today on benign breast disease because it's a very extensive topic. So we have divided into two parts. Uh, we'll start with surgical anatomy of the breast, which will explain the different, uh, uh, including uh, some part of physiology also. So Dr. Sinasi Shah is a secondary university at System Hospital. We'll uh, present the first part, surgical anatomy. Uh, Sinasi, you can share your screen and start. And today, uh, Professor Dittinder Kumar Sarkar is Professor of Surgery and in charge of breast uh, unit at IPGM system will preside about this uh, seminar. <coughs> Sir, uh, good morning, respected teachers. Uh, sir, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Uh, sir, I will uh, request to share my screen, sir. It's allowed, Sneshi. Screen sharing is allowed. Yes, you can share your screen. Yes, sir. Good morning, respected teachers and my fellow colleagues. I'm Dr. Sneashi Shah, second year uh, general surgery resident of IPGMR and SSKM Hospital. And I'll be presenting uh, today's first part of today's seminar on benign breast disease on focusing on surgical anatomy of the breast. Uh, like, uh, surgical anatomy of the breast is uh, incomplete without a brief talk on the uh, development of the breast. The, best developed within the milk line, which uh, extend bilateral between the limb buds of the primordial axilla and distally, which extend to the inguinal area. Uh, in humans, as well as in most mammals, only one pair develop in the pectoral region, while all, while all other birds are uh, involute. In approximately 1% of females, however, uh, supernumerary nipples or breasts uh, can develop. Uh, these lead to developmental anomalies, uh, which can which are known as polyphilia for supernumerary nipples and polymastia for supernumerary breasts. Uh, coming to the functional anatomy of the breast, breast is a modified sweat gland. Uh, it is located within the superficial fascial compartment of the anterior chest wall. It, uh, it functionally consists of 15 to 20 lobules, uh, each of which consists of tubuloalveolar glandular tissue embedded in uh, a fatty parenchyma. The breast tissue is supported by fibrous septa, which extends from the subcutaneous tissue to the fascia of the anterior chest wall. Uh, these fibrous septa are known as the ligaments of Cooper or the suspensory ligaments. Uh, they are of special surgical importance because involvement of these septa in a malignancy need to uh, skin dimping. Uh, the breast extends for, from the level of the second to third rib to the inframammary fold or the sixth or seventh rib inferiorly. The lateral extent of the breast is from the lateral border of the sternum to the anterior or mid axillary line. Uh, of special importance is the space between the deep layer of the superficial fascia posteriorly and the deep investing fascia of the pectoralis major, uh, which is known as the retromammary bursa. Few lymphatics run in this bursa and thus uh, it is to be removed during mastectomy to remove these lymphatics as well. Uh, of clinical uh, significance in knowing the extent of the breast is uh, the extent of raising of flaps in mastectomy. Uh, breast has four quadrants, upper outer quadrant, upper inner quadrant, lower outer quadrant, and lower inner quadrant. The upper outer quadrant has a lateral extension known as the axillary tail or spans, which pierces the deep pectoral fascia known as the foramen of Langer. Uh, the axillary tail of spans has direct communication with the superior, uh, with the anterior group of axillary lymph nodes. Uh, this is also of special importance because uh, we need to remove the axillary lymph node tissue along with the breast tissue in, con in, in con connectivity with the axillary tail of spans. 
Okay. Now coming to the structure of the breast. Uh, in the center of the breast is the nipple, which is the conical projection just below the center at the fourth intercostal space level, 10 centimeters from the midline. Uh, the nipple is pierced by 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts. A uh, few modified sweat and sebaceous glands are present. And nipple also contains circular and longitudinal smooth muscles, which uh, make it flatten or erect uh, accordingly. Areola is the pigmented skin surrounding the nipple which is rich in modified sebaceous glands, particularly at its outer margins. Uh, these sebaceous glands in the outer margin become enlarged during pregnancy and are known as Montgomery's tubercles. Uh, below the areola lie the lactiferous ducts where stored milk is seen. The parenchyma of the breast is composed of tubular alveolar glands which secrete milk. Uh, it consists of 15 to 20 lobes. Each has a cluster of alveoli which is drained by a lactiferous duct. The lactiferous ducts converge towards the nipple and have a dilatation called the lactiferous sinus near the termination. Uh, the lining epithelium of the alveoli is a cuboidal epithelium. Now coming to the arterial supply of the breast, uh, breast, has a, uh, breast has many arterial supply. The chief arterial supply of the breast is from the perforating branches of the internal thoracic artery uh, from the medial side. The main perforating branches are the second and the third uh, perforating branches from the intercostal arteries. Uh, breast also receives arterial supply from the lateral branches, which come from the posterior intercostal arteries. Apart from these two main uh, sources, it also receives branches from the lateral thoracic, uh, the highest thoracic, and the pectoral branches of the thoracoacromial artery, all of which are branches of the axillary artery. Now coming to the venous drainage of the breast, uh, the veins principally accompany the arteries. Uh, there is a superficial venous anastomosis known as a circular venosus uh, in the subareolar region, which joins the deep veins and they form the tributaries. Uh, the main ones are perforating branches of the internal mammary vein, the tributaries of the axillary vein, and the perforating branches of the posterior intercostal veins. The posterior intercostal veins are of special importance because they lie in direct continuity with the vertebral plexus of veins, also known as the Batson's plexus. These, these veins are thus responsible for hematogenous spread of uh, malignancy, uh, which leading to vertebral metastasis. Now coming to the uh, nerve supply of breast, the neurosensory, the neurosensory innervation of the uh, gland is by the lateral and anterior cutaneous branches of the second to sixth intercostal nerves. The sensory nerves originate principally from the fourth, fifth and the sixth intercostal nerves. Although second and the third nerves may also provide cutaneous branches, mainly to the uh, cephalid aspect. But the supply of the breast is by nerves from the cervical plexus, especially the anterior or medial branches of the supraclavicular nerve, uh, which mainly provides sympathetic supply. And coming to the lymphatic drainage of the breast, uh, the primary lymphatic drainage of the breast is into the axillary group of lymph nodes. Uh, the speci specialized lymphatic channels collect under the nipple and the areola and form the uh, sub sapis plexus, which drains uh, mostly into the axillary nodes, accounting for 75% of the total drainage. 20% of the drainage occurs into the internal mammary nodes and 5% of the drainage occurs into the posterior intercostal nodes. Uh, in this di schematic diagram, the flow of the lymphatic channels can be seen. Uh, as it is seen from the, from the lateral aspect, mostly from the lateral aspect, 75% is draining into the axillary nodes, and 20% from the medial aspect is draining into the internal mammary nodes. Uh, in the axillary nodes, most of it is draining into the apical node, and among that, few of them can be drained into the supraclavicular nodes. Uh, the axillary lymph nodes are of five main groups and they run along some few major group of vessels. Uh, the anterior or the pectoral group which runs along the lateral pectoral vessels. The posterior or the subscapular group which run along the subscapular vessels. The lateral or the brachial group which run along the third part of the axillary vessels and the central group which run in the axillary fat at the base of the axilla and the apical group which is at the apex of the axilla. 
uh, based on the relation of the petrolist minor, the, the lymph node levels can be classified as three levels. Uh, this is of importance in lymph node dissection for best malignancies. Level one lymph nodes are are defined as lymph nodes which lie lateral to the pectoralis minor. Uh, these include the anterior or pectoral group, posterior or subscapular group, and lateral or the brachial group. Level 2 lymph nodes uh, in, include the lymph nodes which lie posterior to the pectoralis minor muscle. These include the central group of lymph nodes and the rotors group of lymph nodes or the interpectoral group of lymph nodes. And level 3 lymph nodes are the lymph nodes which lie medial to the pectoralis minor muscle and these include the uh, apical group of lymph nodes. Thank you. Thank you, Sneasis. Uh, sir, will we take the question yes, now? Yes, you can finish up. Five minutes. Yeah. You can finish up this. Yeah. Okay. So, number one, Sneasis, I would like to know about the uh, two or three important facets. Number one is what is the role of, can you tell us the distribution of the chest wall perforators? That is the new anatomy that has come up. So the uh, perforators, so the breast receives arterial supply from the perforating branches of the internal memory artery. Uh, so the, uh, among them, the uh, second and third are the main uh, no, uh, let, let us take this question this way. Okay. Now, it is very important that uh, I don't think... Uh, can I share my screen for uh, for two minutes, sir? Yes, yes. 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 Share his, stop sharing. Yes, sir. Now, this is the anatomy which you must know in relation to breast, okay? Number one is the distribution of, uh, look at this, this is the distribution of the thoracodorsal pedicle, okay? Now look how exactly the thoracodorsal pedicle moves. Now, this is the thoracodorsal pedicle which is present in the posterior wall of the axilla then you will find that there is one branch which is a transverse branch which goes like this and one there is a descending branch. So this supplies the whole of the latissimus torsi muscle from the posterior wall of the axilla. This is one anatomy which you must know because this actually determines that whether you can let, take the latissimus torsi muscle from back to decreate uh, recreate the breast with a latissimus dorsi myocutaneous flap. Now, if you look carefully at this, you will understand another very important thing is that there is a long length. When you are doing an axillary dissection, you will find a long length of this thoracodorsal pedicle lying completely floating on the posterior wall of the axilla, which you must be able to identify and preserve during an axillary dissection. This is an extremely important, relevant surgical anatomy. Now, this is how actually the flap is taken. I will move to the next important thing that you must know. Now, it is very important that you know the anatomy of by virtue of this. Now, look at how the Doppler can exactly locate the perforators. This is the technique. It has to be shaped at 45 degrees. Thank you. 
extremely important the other important thing that you must understand is this is extremely important to know now this is the lateral intercostal artery perforator now if you are able to visualize this is the flap that we have mobilized and here exactly you are seeing the lateral intercostal artery perforator it is situated just lateral to the uh, pectoralis major muscle it encircles the lower edge of the uh, uh, pectoralis major muscle and comes to supply the overlying skin and now here exactly you can see how this artery you can preoperatively localize this artery or by a doppler or during the surgery you will be able to visualize these are very faint arteries this anatomy is extremely important for all of you to know because this is the importance of the surgical anatomy of the breast similarly if you go here you will be able to locate the <coughs> anterior intercostal part of the artery is here and as you go medially you find the medial intercostal artery perforator now in modern day we would be able to take these perforators up to recreate the breast so you must read about lateral intercostal artery perforator medial intercostal artery perforator anterior intercostal artery perforator and a very important one is the tdap perforator i will skip this complex anatomy but one must understand that the tdap perforator is extremely this is what i intend to show you now look at look at this this that comes here is the my cap which is the medial intercostal artery perforator which supplies this zone and you can actually take the whole of the uh, tissue here to actually uh, fill up the medial defects this is the anterior intercostal artery perforator while doing mastectomy you will encounter a lot of amount of bleeding in the lower aspect and you tend to think that the patient is bleeding but these are important vessels which we preserve now and we use them to recreate the breast and this is the lateral intercostal artery perforator which is a very robust flap you can use it not only as push up but you can use it as a sort of propeller to recreate the breast the other important artery that you will find here is the thoracodorsal artery uh, de uh, descending branch so that is called the tdap that artery and the vessel is equally important because based on that we can also recreate the breast so this is the zone which we are looking at which is extremely important in the anatomy this is one very important thing you must know the second important thing you must know is the distribution of the lymphatics in the axilla now the lymphatics of the axilla actually has got two different supply one is from the arm lymphatics the other comes from the breast when we discuss in detail we will be able to tell that the arm lymphatics also have five different patterns now in modern day what we can do is we are able to map out with the newer dyes like icg or methylene blue the pattern of arm lymphatics and vis a vis we would be able to sequester the lymphatics of the breast they are completely two different rivers going in the axilla and if we can preserve the arm lymphatics by reverse axillary mapping we would be able to 
reduce the incidence of lymphedema. This is the second lymphatic anatomy you must know. The third important one is the microscopic anatomy. If you cut that, uh, I mean the breast, the modern anatomy shows that there are two layers of cells. The inner layer, which is called the luminal cells, from which the luminal cancers originate. The outer layer, which are called the myothelial cells. Okay. So, in bit and then the basement membrane comes. So, squeezed in between the luminal cells and the extreme outside border are myothelial cells. The myothelial cells give rise to a different type of cancers, which are basal cancers, and they are more aggressive cancers. They do not express ERPR, whereas the luminal cancers, which originate from the luminal cells. So, three important anatomies apart from the traditional thing you must read. Number one is the chest wall perforated anatomy, which I have just given you a brief. The second one is the lymphatic anatomy, the new one lymphatic anatomy, and third is the microscopic anatomy by which you would be able to explain the different subtypes. Okay. So I, I, I uh, stop sharing and then the next candidate yeah. can proceed. Yes, sir. And another thing is, Snyashish, you said yes, the extent of the breast is from second to uh, seventh rib and uh, lateral vertebral sternum to the uh, uh, anterior axial line. This is the extent of nulliparous breast. If you talk of a multiparous breast, this breast extends little on the uh, other side. That means it goes to the clavicle, clavicle. medially midline, below A3 and posterior to the posterior axial line. That's why we raise flap up to these points in case of a multiparous breast. And uh, you should keep in mind the newer uh, concept. Uh, uh, shown by Professor Shokar. Okay, so we pass on to the uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Ijral. He is from uh, Aura District Hospital. He will speak on nostalgia. It's not mastitis. The topic will be nostalgia. So it will cover the uh, some part of benign breast disease. Yes, Good morning, sir. Myself is Lal Kadri from Howrah District Hospital. I am a second year PGT. Today I will be presenting Mastalia before you. Uh, Mastalia, Mastalia means pain in the breast. The synonym is Mastorinia. 70% uh, of the women will experience Mastalia at some time during their lifetime. Uh, breast pain may be bilateral maybe in only one breast or a part of one breast tissue. It is not unusual for a woman to have two to three days mild breast pain premenstrually. Types of nostalgia, cyclic and non-cyclic. Cyclic, it is usually bilateral. Here the pain arises in the breast tissue itself. It is associated with the cyclic swelling and nodularity of the breast tissue. Non-cyclic, it is usually unilateral and it is not related to the menstrual cycle. Cyclic nostalgia. Here the patient will complain of swelling, pain and tenderness uh, usually 10 days uh, pr uh, preceding menstru menstruation that is in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. And most, most commonly, uh, it is found in the pre-menopausal woman. Bilat and the location of the pain is usually in the bilateral, uh, upper, outer quadrant. There is uh, distension of duct, hyperemia, and edema of the interstitial tissue. Theories to describe the cyclic nostalgia. During uh, luteal phase, there is a high serum estrogen to progesterone ratio, which is due to decrease in the progesterone. And there is high level of prolactin levels and uh, increased sensitivity of the estrogen, uh, estrogen receptors in the breast tissue. And uh, there is elevated level or abnormality of the lipid metabolism, which uh, leads to the cyclic nostalgia. Non-cyclic nostalgia, uh, there is no uh, fixed pattern and it is not associated with the menstrual cycle. 
it is usually well localized uh, uh, causes chest wall teeth syndrome that is uh, actually tender a tender uh, costochondral junction just between ribs and cartilage 1 to 2 cm uh, lateral to the sternum these uh, are the uh, uh, arising from the breast itself it is usually diffuse uh, the patient will having uh, will have diffuse breast pain and uh, she will be having trigger spots in the breast example uh, infection or breast uh, or abscess in the breast and infected cyst other non breast causes like uh, cervical or thoracic spondylitis and uh, lung diseases and gallstone diseases treatment of the cyclic mastalgia use uh, we have to reassure the patient after excluding the uh, cancer usually usually uh, breast uh, this mastalgia is rare rarely a symptom in the uh, ca breast 5 to 8% of the women will experience that pain during ca breast and uh, we'll ask the patient to uh, chart the uh, do the breast pain charting adequate support uh, should be prescribed like a breastry during the daytime and soft breastry support during night time and you have to ask the patient to decrease the caffeine intake caffeine will be having methyl xanthine but in the randomized control trial it has failed to demonstrate the benefit for the caffeine restriction and we have to normalize the uh, irregular um, menstrual um, irregular periods in the female we can prescribe simple analgesics uh, like nsaids evening primrose oil is but it, it is better uh, in the it has better effect in the women of age more than 40 years danazol it is a synthetic steroid it suppresses the production of gonadotropin it also has some androgenic effects uh, some of the adverse effects like uh, it can cause increase in the weight uh, it causes the weight gain deepening of the voice in the female and menorrhagia a dose is is 100 mg daily for 3 months tamoxifen it has least side effect uh some of the adverse effect includes uh, hot flushes when vaginal dryness a bromocriptine it is a prolactin inhibitor we can also prescribe carbogolin it is a long acting dopamine agonist and non steroidal estrogen receptor modulator like uh, ormelozyphen non cyclic mastalgia treatment Uh, for chest wall causes we have to reassure and prescribe anesthetics if the tenderness is localized to one point we can uh, inject uh, prednisolone 40 mg with the local anesthesia and uh, for non cyclic pain arising from the breast for example like breast infection or abscess we have to uh, do ind and uh, treat with the antibiotics thank you thank you jalal uh if you could stop sharing your uh, slide then we would be able to discuss things now uh, the first question i would like to ask you is that do you have any idea about the newer physiological concept of the duct and how it is responsible for nostalgia no sir okay now let me tell you how it happens again as i told the microscopic neo anatomy of the breast is extremely important it comprises of the inner uh, luminal cells the uh, the intermediate myopterial cells and outer uh, uh, sort of basement membrane now these myopterial cells play a major role you have talked about raised lipid level now what happens is 
these group of patients, they usually have raised lipid level and that produces a sort of insulin resistance. And this insulin actually has been found to act through insulin-like growth factors on the myopterial cells. And therefore, the myopterial cells tend to get relaxed as a result of which there is stretching of the duct, which is responsible for this pain. So this is one new concept that have come, the role of insulin, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia and lifestyle disorder in initiating uh, cyclical nostalgia. This is one point you must know. The second important point is uh, for everybody to understand that vitamin E has been thrown into garbage and nobody should be prescribing or writing vitamin E as any sort of role in uh, breast pain. So that is out. Even evening primrose oil, which was rated very strongly, has been found by the last meta-analysis to be completely ineffective. And at present, you should not also be prescribing evening primrose oil. Danazol has got a very weak evidence. I mean, that is also not a very strong evidence, uh, which would mandate that we use this because anazol, danazol, prolonged use have some androgenic side effects, as you rightly said, weight gain, sort of hirsutism in some group of patients. What have stood the test of time? Now you talked about cabergolin. Again, cabergolin is not being used in the West. There are strong evidence to suggest that the side effect profile is higher and therefore cabergolin is no longer used. What remains today in cyclical nostalgia is the use of tamoxifen. Now, uh, Ijlal, can you tell us what is the exact dose in which uh, a tamoxifen is used in breast pain? Sir, uh, around sir, 20 mg per day. No, dear. That's why I, you told about hot flushes, etc. It is used at a dose of 10 milligram once a day on alternate days for three to four months. So do you get the actual dose? So it's okay. not the high dose tamoxifen that we use for uh, 20 milligram in cancer. This is 10 milligram thrice weekly. So in one week, a patient gets three doses of tamoxifen and she continues it for three to four weeks, depending on the response. And the response rate has been found somewhere between 65 to 75%. Clear? So that is very important. The other thing which I found uh, in your presentation, rightly, is one of the major causes is non-cyclical nostalgia. And... There are recent evidences to suggest that one of the major causes of non-cyclical nostalgia is vitamin D deficiency. We have actually three publications on vitamin D deficiency, and these are musculoskeletal pain caused due to gross vitamin D deficiency, and correction of vitamin D often is associated with reduction of non-cyclical nostalgia. So I would also urge you to include vitamin D deficiency as a cause of musculoskeletal pain in non-cyclical nostalgia. Rest of the things I found was perfectly normal. So practice changing words that you must remember is EPO is out. Danazol has weak evidence. Uh, Cabergolin is out. Uh, tamoxifen 10 milligram on alternate days and vitamin D has got a decent role in non-cyclical nostalgia. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. There are some reports of hormonal vaccine being effective in some cases. There are some some publications exactly. that also should be on alternate days. Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so we we'll have the last presentation. Uh, dark ectasia is a very uh, common uh, benign base disease. Dr. Anish Pandey is a second year PGT at uh, RKM uh, University of Medical Sciences. I will present. Dr. Anish, you can please yes, share your screen. Sir, is screen visible? Not yet. Dr. Min, can you please share my screen?
थैंक यू मिलिंद सर इज इट इज विजिबल हेलो हेलो यस यू आर विजिबल डॉक्टर रानी ओके ओके गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू रिस्पेक्टेड सर रिस्पेक्टेड सीनियर्स एंड माय डियर बैचमेट्स टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट द बिनाइन ब्रेस्ट डिजीज दैट इज डक्ट एक्टेसिया memory duct ectasia is a non proliferative inflammatory disorder of the large duct of the breast as such it affects nipple areola complex this is basically the uh, uh, ductal arrangement of the breast and uh, it is uh, well explained in the first seg segment that is uh, there is a terminal ductal lobular unit peripheral ducts then sub uh, subsegmental ducts segmental ducts which results uh, which opens into the lactiferous ducts and uh, there is a uh, structural arrangement of nipple areola complex next now we come to the epidemiology the exact incidence of this abnormality is unknown it is mainly seen in the perimenopausal women 45 to 55 years of age it is more common in smokers and those with congenital nipple inversions or malformations as well etiology the exact cause of the disease process is still unclear and some authors consider it as a part of aging process due to involutional change of the fatty periductal tissue pregnancy lactation and abortion history are all inconsistently related to the development of the mammary duct ectasia pathophysiology the presumed pathogenesis is that the affected duct becomes dilated and tortuous either due to the breast involution or other factors and accumulates granular debris with numerous lipid laden macrophages periductal collagenization and fibrosis may eventually produce skin and nipple retraction which may predispose to this condition histopathology excised duct specimen from patient with mammary duct ectasia reveals dilated lactiferous ducts with accumulated secretion and potentially blood in the intraductal space the duct wall shows reduced elastin and inflammatory infiltrates with macrophage and plasma cells around the duct granulation tissue may fill the duct lumen there is a lack of epithelial hyperplasia or apocrine metaplasia and this is an important feature micro abscesses are often seen in severely complicated cases around the dilated ducts calcification denudations of the epithelial cells with focal loss of microvilli can also be seen in the next picture we are seeing the dilated ducts with foamy macrophages and periductal scarring next clinical features memory duct ectasia is frequently asymptomatic or only have subtle changes in the breast textures that go unnoticed until a nipple discharge occur the nipple discharge in memory duct ectasia is variable ranging from thick to thin serous dirty white yellow or green and may fluctuate it is usually unilateral originating from a single duct though bilateral cases have been reported occasionally patient with memory duct ectasia may present with a small ovoid well defined sub areolar or peri areolar tender mass next here we are seeing the uh, consequences of the uh, nipple uh, memory duct ectasia which may results in the abscess memory duct fistula nipple retraction or may form the lump next evaluation we will do the triple assessment clinical imaging and needle biopsy mammographic finding of the uh, memory duct ectasia results in the microcalcification lobulated partially smooth mass nipple retraction retroalveolar duct dilatations ultrasound finding suggest memory duct dilatation mixed solid or cystic mass close to the areola if you do mri thick wall lesions with circular enhancement with no enhancement in the center representing a thickened duct next galactography can be done memory duct ectasia is diagnosed when there is a duct is more than 3 mm in diameter and is smooth wall without ductal filling defect nipple discharge cytology can be done which uh, shows duct cells foam cells and blood cells fibroductoscopy can be done which shows memory ductal ectasia uh, complete duct occlusion can be visualized next here we are seeing the usg of the uh, uh, breast which shows the ectatic duct and there is a, a normal duct next now we come to the treatment since the exact cause is still unknown there is a no specific treatment and all uh, all treatments are aimed to be the symptomatic relief and excluding more ma malicious pathologies 
in mild cases presented only with intermittent nipple discharge after excluding other disease and confirm mammary duct ectasia reassurance is the adequate and all that is required next Patient with discharge and discomfort are advised to apply cold, uh, hot compressions over the central part of the breast, wearing breast supports and maintaining nipple areola complex hygiene. The majority of patients will improve dramatically with the antibiotic treatment and pain medications. The pre-areolar discomfort and swelling will subside in majority of the cases with, follow, with above treatments. In case with consistent or recurrent symptoms and swelling, excision of the involved duct and surrounding inflammatory tissue is performed, which is known as the microdochectomy. or excision of the multiple uh, major ducts can be done that is known as the hatfields procedures the complications can be recurrent attack of the inf inflammation recurrent infections fistula abscess and uh, thick nip nipple discharge thank you thank you thank you dr anish <clears throat> now Again, dark tectasia is an extremely important issue that we face in clinical practice. Now, uh, you have rightly told, and let us say, stepwise understand what happens in dark tectasia. Step one in dark tectasia is the weakening of the myothelial cell. Again, as I told, Snehasis, it is extremely important to understand the microscopic anatomy of the breast. then the role of myothelial cell and the role of dyslipidemia and insulin resistance that plays on these myothelial cells the step one is the myothelial cells are lost and these myothelial cells if they are weak it leads to sort of dilatation of the breast ducts this yes. is step one and this at this stage we just call is ductal dilatation you the patient comes with pain in the breast uh, it might be a usually cyclical or non cyclical pain whatever the patient uh, depending on the age of the patient <laughs> number 2 the patient might have serous discharge coming out at yes. times the patient might also have sero sanguinous discharge depending on if there is secondary infection in that or not the yes. insulting agent for this myothelial cell damage is usually atherosclerotic changes lifestyle disorders like dyslipidemia diabetes mellitus but everything actually boils down to insulin like growth factor uh, problem on the breast duct yes. in the second phase what happens is that there is effacement of the lining epithelium so there is a breach in the lining epithelium so what happens is that the secretions go outside the duct into the periductal space this is the stage 2 once it goes into the periductal space what happens is that it irritates the periductal breast parenchymal tissue it also provokes inflammatory reaction which generates oxygen free radical it is exactly like a venous ulcer that happens in a varicose vein so there is oxygen free radical generation which destroys the uh, surrounding uh, breast parenchyma this is stage 2 now in the stage 2 the patients usually present with breast abscess so there can be two locations of breast abscess one which is in the peri neck area which is also known as the zuska's disease and you will find it very commonly in elderly patients in in globally now the commonest cause of breast abscess is periductal mastitis following duct ectasia in our country it still remains mostly lactational mastitis is the cause but globally no longer lactational mastitis but duct ectasia leading to periductal mastitis is the major cause in the third stage it ruptures and opens to form periductal uh, sinuses and fistula now once there is development of periductal uh, i mean abscess leading to a fistula you this patient will require uh, i i mean a, 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 a lactiferous duct excision with end block excision 
and most of these patients are postmenopausal and they it is safe to go for a head field operation or total duct excision whereas if the patient is perimenopausal i mean premenopausal and have not crossed the age of lactation you can do an in block excision of lactiferous duct with microdocectomy but once the patient has crossed the lactational period or post menopausal go for head fill procedures so this is the stage stage 1 is just duct ectasia mastalgia teras or serotonin discharge in most of the patient conservative approach if there is copious discharge you need to go for a microdocectomy slash total duct excision stage 2 is periductal mastitis and abscess formation where you can go for an ultrasound guided aspiration and stage 3 is the stage of fistula or sinus formation when you require an in block excision of the sinus along with the duct structure did you get my point yes sir thank you thank you sir okay uh, any any question from any of the participants any question sir sir any... sir i have a question yes yes What sir uh, duct sir duct ectasia and periductal me hello Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Sir, duct ectasia and the periductal mastitis can be used synonymously, or there is a difference. I mean, oh. sir, in the duct ectasia is the beginning. As I said, in stage yes, one, sir. it is duct ectasia. Ectasia. It is beginning of saccular dilatation of the ductal system, and there yes. may be an out pouching. But once the the secretions go outside due to effacement of the lining epithelium outside it provokes inflammatory reaction and produces periductal mastitis that stage 2 but when there is just dilatation without any uh, going out then we would restrict it as duct ectasia and when there is a provocation of inflammatory reaction it is periductal mastitis thank you sir Dr. Maithi, any comment? Thank you. Good morning, uh, sir. Thank you, uh, where Professor Dipendra Sarkar and Professor Makhulal Sah are there, and this was a nice discussion with their uh, illuminating uh, comments and opinion. But a few points I I like to mention that in the presentation, in the non-cyclical mastalgia, some points, some uh, diagnoses were included which are outside the breast. i think uh, mastalgia the term should be restricted within the breast the causes like kids disease and the causes outside the breast should come in the differential diagnosis of non cyclical mastitis i don't know uh, what will be the comment from dipendra so those cases which are outside the breast should not come under the heading of non cyclical mastalgia that should come under the differential diagnosis and uh, i want to also know the comments regarding the role of vitamin a The doctor Professor Sarkar has said vitamin A E is not popular nowadays, but vitamin A, which was a drug which was very commonly used in the past in our uh, residency, but I think uh, till now vitamin A I am using in some of the patients because vit vitamin A has the role of regularizing the epithelial growth. So as uh, it is very commonly used, you know, in uh, case of uh, your uh, vitamin a deficiency where there are multiple warts they disappears with vitamin a i think uh, vitamin a may have some role i want the comments from uh, dipendra regarding vitamin a and regarding the dose of sevista that is the ornoxifer uh, how long it can be given and what is the exact dose and uh, maximum period or in between two uh, doses in between the two courses what should be the gap that should be discussed uh, please make the comment on those and regarding the dark ectasia when the student was discussing uh, describing the clinical features uh, he has missed the breeding professor sarkar has already mentioned sero sanguinous but sometimes it is a frank blood it may not be mixed with even seras it may be um, the blood itself and uh, uh, regarding the memory fistula the question is when uh, there is a development of memory fistula and if it becomes uh, quiescent after the discharge of the of the infective content and if there is no symptom for long time whether still will opt for operation or wait for the uh, repeat 
inflammatory signs to uh, select the operative treatment or we'll just wait and if there is no discharge if the sinus has healed that my questions please discuss on those points sir, sir the first question you asked was uh, I, I forgot the first non question non-cyclical nostalgia whether the causes outside the breast should be included. This should be rather included in the differential diagnosis of non cyclical nostalgia. Sir, you are right, but actually the modern, all the recent textbook, they have divided. So the, the uh, who was presenting is just possibly, uh, he wrote it from textbook where it has been divided as nostalgia, cyclical and non-cyclical. And non-cyclical is again divided into uh, non-breast cause and breast causes. So he has taken it from the book, sir. So in the books, that is what is being written by. I totally agree with you. Now, myocardial infarction can be a DD in clinical practice. But in, in, in while they are writing their answer, possibly for exam, that is how the textbook have described. And he has possibly taken it from the textbook. Uh, the second question was, sir, vitamin A. Yes. Sir, uh, sir, I think it's a great idea and uh, though of course in exams they can only write about tamoxifen, reassurance, etc. But it would be a great idea to run a study on uh, the role of uh, vitamin mm -hmm. A. Uh, you are using it, sir. We can always uh, start a, a, any of the DNB candidates can take this up as a thesis uh, and therefore there will be a good data to understand how it works. But theoretically, as you said, sir, yes. But textbook as of now has not put it or it was there possibly in the back. Now they have not put it because they uh, base mostly on evidences. The third question, sir, was uh, persistent uh, ductal discharge without any symptoms. Is no, uh, no, there is no discharge. Initially, patient presented with features of dark ectasia and then it developed a fistula and fistula is healed the or then, does, there is no then, research then, whether then. to opt for uh, operation or not no 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 sir no so, sir. Uh, so how, with how many uh, sequences suppose the patient developed discharge for the second time and then it again healed so will you consider the number of uh, attacks number of fistula formation is sir, there any uh, study that suppose two no, no sir it is basically the patient's quality of life which is important if the patient presents with recurrent inflammation then the permanent solution is this i completely agree to those patients who come to me with a small discharging sinus and they heal after a conservative treatment i would not offer them surgery to begin with but if there are recurrent symptoms and there are multiple sinuses which is uh, hampering the quality of life of the patient yes sir some form of surgery may be needed but if there are multiple sinuses one very important thing to exclude is idiopathic granulomatous mastitis and to exclude tuberculosis before you jump on to a diagnosis of dark ectasia and try to excise it because if it is tuberculosis and you excise it you may end up in a major problem and another query i don't know how frequently uh, the anti-inflammatory uh, agents other than NSAID, the, in the injective form, the placentrex, steroidine, those are uh, non-specific, uh, usually they are very commonly used in the past. Yeah. No, but these are not uh, uh, current uh, evidence to describe that this should be used. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, someone asks a uh, boundary regulation, that is uh, part of uh, uh, CA breast discussion, but uh, you should keep in mind what sort of aggregation are doing. Either it's a level 1, level 2, or it's a complete aggregate dissection. If it's a complete aggregate dissection, medially it should be up to the holster ligament. There is a costoclavial ligament. Laterally, thoracodorsal vessels. Okay. And uh, when you go to the axillary vein, don't bear the axillary vein. As Dr. Uh, Sarkar has said, there are arm lymphatics coming up. So it is the anterior and inferior uh, region of the axillary vein that should be bared. You should not bear the whole axillary vein. Superiorly, the arm lymphatics goes. And below it is said that there is an angular vein uh, which is coming from the uh, thoracodorsal vein. So that is the limit of the axillary section for a complete axillary section. 
Dr. Sarkar, anything to add? No, no, sir. Absolutely fine. That you have uh, rightly uh, told uh, this uh, question as you have answered it, sir. Another, another point uh, who talked on the lymphatic drainage uh, of the breast. I think uh, a mention is also is better to be made. That is the crossing of the lymphatics across the midline, and there is communication of the lymphatics of both the breast across the midline, and the communication of the lymphatics of the anterior abdominal wall. Because in some cases we have seen, uh, other other than the transit nodule, the uh, that is the your uh, satellite nodules are often found in case of advanced breast carcinoma where the, there is a blockage of the lymph nodes at the axilla and the nodes more medially and inferiorly on the anterior abdominal wall or across the midline we may find the, uh, the nodules skin nodules. I I give them your experience, Dr. Saha, Professor Saha. Whether that should be mentioned, the lymphatics of the breast have some communication, but that is that may not be active. Uh, but it has communication with the opposite breast across the midline, as well as the lymphatics of the anterior abdominal wall, and they opens up when there is a blockade in the usual uh, the flow. I agree, sir. There are crossing of lymphatics at the at the midline level, and therefore, uh, though of course. If there is a metastatic in the opposite axilla, that would be considered as a metastatic disease. Uh, but yes, there is crossing of lymphatics at the midline level, sir. And the Krugenbach is explained by the reticular lymphatic spread only now. If you talk of Krugenbach tumor in breast cancer, it is because of reticular lymphatic spread, not a uh, dropping in the peritoneal cavity from CA breast. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shaka, Dr. Maiti, and all the participants. We finish up today. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.